My name is Matthias Clausen. Today I'm your host. And with me is Clemens Fouls, the co-host of the today's show. If you yeah, like to read the bio of us two, I mean we have presented them in the webinars before, so before that's getting boring over the time. Um, just a few words. I'm the software, one of the software engineers and editors at Elector. Clemens is uh, the technical manager of the Elector Labs. Um, also good in software and hardware development. And you may also recognize his face from our Elector TV channel and the nice videos he's uploading. So without further note, let's head over to what we will cover today. Um, we are going through the principles of motor control for DC brushed motors, stepper motors, brushless DC motors, so BLDC ones, and AC motors. Um, we have to talk about age switches, how they work, um, and fed only versions and discrete versus fully integrated ones. And at the end, we will do some theory of BLDC driving and also some theory for AT, uh, AC motor control. Um, yeah, the main thing if we are doing motor control uh, for DC motors, stepper motors, we will deal many, many times with H bridges. So let's have a look what an H bridge is and why it's good to understand how that's been used and what's in there. An age bridge for driver motor, and we have an article in the current elector about these topics also, um, is used to not just turn your motor on and off, but also, as you can see, it's constructed of a pair of four transistors, and in this case, two additional transistors uh, to drive the motor forward and backward, a DC motor, so the polarity at M1 can be switched. So with uh, pulsing or using a PWM, you can control the speed of the motor. And also with this construct, uh, you have the ability to break a motor. Um, problem with uh, transistors in this case, um, you will have a huge, in this case, power dissipation, so they get warm. And one interesting thing here is the problem of a shut through. So let's uh, look at T1 and T2. For example, if we switch a motor from forward to backward, so that in the forward direction, current would flow through T1 and T4 over the motor. And if we switch the motor backwards, a current should flow from T3 to T2 in the diverse, uh, reverse direction. Thanks, Clemens, for pointing that out. Um, there's a, if we switch the direction, there could be a short moment if you don't design your circuit carefully where T1 and T2 could be conductive. So they are not fully off. So you will have an almost short circuit from your VCC to ground through T1 and T2 or T3 and T4 vice versa. So that needs to be taken into account if you are doing your own H bridge designs. But besides the power dissipation, um, you don't need to use transistors. You can also use, use field effect transistors, which have a fairly lower resistance. So you will have a lower power dissipation. You can use four of them. You can control with this setup and four field effect transistors, speed and direction. This one here uses P-channel and N-channel FET. And you also will see that with those combination of P and N-channel FETs, the resistance of an P-FET is magnitudes worse than those of an N-FET. So that means if your N-FET goes down to 0 0.01 ohms, and P-channel FET will be at 0 0.1 ohm. So the idea would be, hey, can't we change that to an N1? And also, and with this construct, if we don't do the timing for the 
PWMA and PWMA not not carefully, we will also have the shuttle through problem. But with the advantage or disadvantage that T1 and T2 would be much more conductive and lead to much higher currents flowing from VCC to ground than with the transistor ones, worst case. So what to do? Um, if you are using microcontrollers, you can use software. And also if you're using microcontrollers, have a look at the PWM datasheet. They are ones around that will do the a dead time insertion for you with no further invention needed. So we can use an NFET only design that works, has an even lower power dissipation for the H bridge drive than the P and NFET combination, but there's something to consider. Um, to get this working, um, T1 and T3, the topper field effect transistors now, are only conductive if V gate, so the signal of PWMA and uh, PWMB, is bigger than the VCC of our motor. And the maximum delta we can have between the PWMA and a signal and the power supply of the motor is approximately 20 volts. If we exceed that, um, it's not healthy for the FET and could kill that. So uh, an option is, um, or an easy option that you can choose here is to use um, h bridge driver, the ICs. Those will prevent the shutthrough will get you the correct voltage, um, limit the voltage delta between gate and your, VC, uh, your, your supply voltage. And uh, one of those chips you can use is the NCP5901 from OMSEMI or the STM6384D, for example. So, then this leads so uh, to, yes, you can build your own discrete h bridge drives. And this can be <clears throat> a little bit more space consuming, but they are simple to drive um, still. And the discrete ones are easy to repair. If one transistor fails, you just replace those. Um, fully integrated ones are even more compact, um, even simpler to drive or as simple to drive as the discrete one, um, offers even more protection in terms of uh, over voltage, over current, um, temperature, temperature folds, uh, fat folds, but due to its size are restricted in the maximum power they can deliver. And if one of those fully integrated ones fails, you have to replace the chip, which is more expensive than a single fat in the end. And the side you can see to fully integrated ones. Interestingly, the uh, L298N one is not an FET one, but that's a transistor, a dual H bridge. So, uh, but you see those uh, really commonly used in some projects. And with that, as a short walkthrough, the next thing to look at are stepper motors. And they don't do rotations, but they do one step at a time. Stepper motors offer for every step a high torque. They don't have brushes, so you don't have any contacts that will uh, go to the rotor. Have no constant rotation. Um, step at defined or rotate at defined angle per step can step easily forward and backward. And for stepper motors, and that's also something you will find in the ebook we provide, is the distinction between uh, bipolar and unipolar configurations. So the question is, how does it make a stepper motor step and not rotate? 
And uh, it's quite easy if you know how. Um, the core or the rotor itself is built out of a permanent magnet with a north, a north and a south pole. You can see here uh, marked in, in blue and red. So those two gears you can see are shifted or shifted against each other. Yeah, thanks, Clements. Um, that leads to, if you look at the rotor with the A and B coils at the strator, um, to the ability to move those one step at a time by energizing the coils A and B appropriately. And a sample schematic to make it step with the L298N um, is uh, drawn here. So you can see how to energize the coils A and B um, with a positive or negative magnet field so that the T's of the gears will be uh, positioned a uh, step for a step back. So the step sequence is um, A, B, call on in the first step, and then you see that there's a moving pattern. So uh, through from A to D, the um, ones get shifted. And with four shifts, uh, you do a step in one direction. And that's quite simple. If you want to have a step backward, you just do it in the reverse order. So going from one to four and upwards. And as I told, there are two stepper motor types. You can see here with the two coils, uh, my claimants can show them with terminal A, D, and B, and A in M1. You can see that those coils are connected to the L28N, uh, 298N, which consists of two H bridges. So the coil A to B can be um, have a current flow from B to A or A to B. So getting a north or a south pole configuration in that one. And this is where you need two H bridges to yeah, put the calls in reverse to say. And be able to step it forward or backward. And those who are doing any kind of CNC machinery or 3D printing will have seen those stepper drivers in their uh, printing boards. So this is quite common to have those around, I think. So as said, there are two types of stepper motors. Um, the first one we saw, I said, you will maybe recognize from 3D printers because that's the most common used ones with the best uh, torque to uh, size ratio. And then there are unipolar ones. The unipolar ones are easier to drive. They don't require two full H bridges. Uh, they just require a set of pull stages. As you can see from the drawing of the unipolar stepper motor, there's a middle tab. That means if we want to get the coil magnetized in one or the other way, um, we just use the half of those, the left or the, or the right side, by putting those sides uh, to ground. That's quite easy to do. So the, um, what is it, uh, ULN 2003 or uh, would be sufficient for these smaller stepper motors. You find also those things in many, many small Arduino starter kits. The disadvantage of driving a stepper motor in this way is that you'll lose half of the torque. Um, yeah, 
you could also use or misuse the uh, Trait 9 to drive unipolar stepper motors, but you would need more as you need a uh, pull stage to ground at that point. The interesting thing is if you look at the schematic for the unipolar setup, you now could come to the uh, idea and just cut the VCC wire that uh, connects the two coils together. And with the stepper motors you see above, um, there are some models where this is also possible to do so. So you can convert a unipolar stepper motor into a bipolar stepper motor and gain double the torque out of it. And then use an uh, 289, uh, 298, 98N to drive it. So, yeah, this is all the, the small tricks you could do. Uh, on the other hand, you can't convert a bipolar stepper motor to a unipolar one without really messing around. Don't do it. Don't try it. It's not going to work. Oh, I saw a pen walking around. So, yep. No more drawing from Clemens at this point. So, yeah, that's basically the uh, stepper motors at this point. Um, the next thing, so this is quite common. I think you have already done one or the other to step or control it. Um, the next thing, and this is um, the more interesting and more complicated thing, is the brushless DC motor. Brushless DC motor, if we uh, look at it, uh, a combination of a DC motor and a hybrid stepper motor. Um, they have no brushes, so the rotor um, is uh, not electrically connected uh, to any wires that, that are per this are permanent magnets, so less maintenance. They offer high torque on a really compact size. Um, they are available with and without Hall effect sensors. Um, the Hall effect sensor in this motor is used to determine the position of the rotor. And as mentioned in the beginning, they are not easy to drive. So um, let's have a look what we need to do. We need three half bridges, half H bridges to drive those. Um, if you don't have an Hall effect sensor, um, you can use the electromagnetic back force that's generated inside those, th uh, those motors. But if you use those concepts, the startup from zero RPM to a certain revolution will be uh, need to done blindly, and your controller needs to be adjusted to the motor you're using and its characteristics. You need a precise timing to do so. If you don't do so, um, the motor won't like it to call it, to call it nicely, and um, yeah, you, you need a kind of MCU or fully integrated BLDC driver to get those up and running. And why we will have a short look. So there are two versions. Um, there's the option to have an inner rotor with permanent magnets. And, and outside with coils, or the other way around. You have uh, the, the inside um, is static with coils, and you will drive the outside the, uh, of the motor around. And in this case, there will be a shell of permanent magnets, north and south, and a set of free coils in this case for the motor. And yep, as I can see for the BLC and uh, BLDC drive in the chat, we already uh, have some attendees that gave give tips what could be used. So um, yeah, back to how it works. So you have the permanent magnet on the outside, drawing color. This will be those two. This will be the permanent magnet. 
that is able to rotate. And then you have a pair of coils, A, B, and C, or three pairs of coils. What you now do is you need to magnetize the coil pair, in this case B, in a way that uh, the upper B opposite to, to the north will be south and vice versa on the other side. What we now do is we start to rotate our magnet field. This means we will disable the pair B and we will at this point um, enable the pair C. This will move the um, external static uh, permanent, uh, the external permanent magnet further and move it to start a rotation. You can also now see that the pair of B is um, reversed so that B now will not attract the south but will push it away towards the pair C to give it even more torque in this moment. But as you can see, the timing here needs to be done carefully. If you, for whatever reason, rotate or do this sequence too fast, at a certain point, the ex uh, external permanent magnet will, will start to shake, best case, or do other interest, interesting things. Um, so a precise timing is required the, for this one. So you can see in the next step, if we are south opposite to, to the uh, coil C, um, we will start the game again, change the north and south pool for C, enable A, uh, the, the uh, coil pair A, and start to attract. Um, two, uh, two, coil, two coils are, um, two coil pairs are powered at a time with a certain sequence. So what is now happening? And this is uh, the uh, this is um, the uh, going to to um, to be able to control it. You need to know the rotor position to get your timing right. Um, what is now happening if your permanent magnets if if uh, is moving towards the coil um, step three? If your permanent magnet is moving towards the coil pair B, they will uh, induce a current or voltage um, to this pair so that you can grab those uh, voltage with a microcontroller and calculate um, when the magnets would move at least halfway now through the uh, B coil pair. If that's the case, then it's time to do the next moving forward step to do uh, the BL, uh, BLDC drive. The problem is the lower your RPMs are, the lower is the voltage you will get. So as I said in the beginning, there will be a small period where you have to drive this engine blind from the uh, timing. So we can look at uh, a possible application, how to use it. Uh, this is taken from a few microchip app uh, application notes. So the AVR 928, uh, 498, and also the microchip AN3998 are a good source if you like to know how to do it. There are also a few uh, code samples you could try out if you like to, but you can also use a non microchip AVR to do this. If you like to do, build your own BLDC motor driver. If you like to learn the lessons, you like to, uh, you have to learn. But yeah, you can see um, the the power stage is not that complicated. The more complicated part is then in the uh, position determination and also in the software side to get the timing right. So this is just a short sample of. Uh, okay. Um, and Edmund will look in the chat and see what's wrong. Um, yep. 
So this is the basic way of driving it. Um, if you like to play around, be carefully with the BLDC motors. Make sure that they are tighted correctly and have an appropriate load to start up. Yeah. So, or use a already done motor driver for those. The so last thing on our to-do list are the AC motors. Um, we have here some theory for leading trailing edge and variable frequency control. Um, there are three ways to do it. So phase fired control, variable frequency control, and integrated integral cycle control. The things you will mostly see are the first two, phase fired control and variable frequency control. The integral cycle control, um, I haven't seen that uh, that often in the past. So for the phase fired control, that's something your light, light dimmers would also do, depending on your light dimmer. Um, those run on mains frequency um, uses the leading edge to do, um, allows an RPM control. Controlling the AC motors with the uh, phase fired control. So you can't use any motor. Um, you have to be carefully to choose which one. So usually you only single phase motors that don't have a kind of capacitor to start um, should be used. Um, if you have a multi-phase motor, uh, phase fired control is certainly not an option. But if you like to do so, uh, look at the electro we had in project if, uh, a few issues ago, I think a year ago or two years ago. I can not remember those uh, tested in the lab um, and read through it, how that's done. It's quite interesting. The um, other option are the variable frequency control. So that's for whatever in, uh, motor you use, the best thing to do because it puts the least stress to the engine. Uh, I can, is the audio gone again? I think, ah, audio is back. Uh, your audio is fine. Okay. Um, the variable frequency control means that uh, you have the 50 or 60 hertz mains frequency that go into the uh, system. And that the system or the, the variable frequency controller will get an non, uh, a frequency that is something between zero and whatever it's capable to do of uh, hertz. And the nice thing in this concept is that it's also suitable not only for a single phase, but also multi-phase motors. So you have a high amount of torque, uh, even from the beginning. You can use multi-phase motors and it works by uh, rectifying the mains voltage, getting a high uh, voltage DC uh, in between, and then uses a DC to AC converter with, with a variable frequency that can be controlled from the outside. So your speed control to drive the motor. And if you look at that, you can also remove the mains and the rectifier and use a high voltage, maybe car battery instead to drive an uh, AC motor. So that's also an option. And with this, for this uh, presentation, we are for the topic of motor control at the end. But um, if you like to, you can join our next webinar, Coding with Platform.io. It will be on the 14th of April this year. You can head over to electromagazine.com slash webinars to see what's coming up or what you may have missed. And also, if you like to get some additional resources, um, have a look at the webinars page or the uh, Electrobook and Introduction Intro Brushless DC Motor Control. Or if you like to stay informed of, of upcoming events, may look at the Electro Easy or Electro Newsletter page. I think so. uh, the first next uh, webinar will be uh, Hello FPGA. 
I think that's in March, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. That's with, together with microchip. Uh, yeah, so now we can uh, try to, uh, no, the 22nd of March, so there we go. Uh, maybe try to answer some questions. What type of isolators to use for high sides? Needs to get that in the right context. Yep, high voltage drive. Um, depends on the circuitry um, and how you like to, to build it. Um, then for the high voltage, I think you would need to use IGBT um, types. Uh, so the, the 600 volt capable ones and also have a look um, for an appropriate IGBT uh, drive circuitry. Here we have a question. How big a brushless motor man can build? Well, I think that's a matter of resources and time and uh, how much you really want to do that. I think we can do it uh, pretty big. So as the commercial var variable frequency converter is said to be able to control between 5 and 400 hertz, does this mean that the controlled motor then runs at eight times the speed compared to 50 hertz? Um, if we talk about one phase, yes. If we talk about three, fa three or more phase motors, that's a different story. As was said in the comments, I don't know if you saw it, it was mentioned that the ratio voltage frequency must be uh, remain constant. So if you just up the frequency, the motor will not uh, necessarily spin any faster. Um, for the IGBT drives, um, currently I don't have a recommendation. Sorry for that. No, getting lost in the questions. Um, yeah, um, if, if I lose the timing, yes, at a certain point, this can happen that yeah, that it just will uh, quote, shake a little bit and then come back to the right timing or will never come back to the right timing, depending on how heavily it will get out of whatever you do. So, and then what happens? Um, worst, worst case, uh, that could happen. Um, usually you, you're um, pulling the, the outside magnets around. If your field is moving too fast, you have a little bit of, you have a little bit of slip. And if it moves really too fast, it could be that it's uh, pulling uh, your, your external moving part backwards for a certain, uh, for a short moment. Okay, then we go to the next one. How does the BLDC motor realize its phase shift? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand this question. Uh, I'm also not fully sure. Um, is it intended for the for the three phases uh, it has to, to drive A, B, uh, and and uh, C in the appropriate timing? Uh, if that's the idea, then you have those three half bridges uh, that will drive the coils, and then you need a microcontroller that uh, to do the timing accordingly. Exactly. The motor itself doesn't do any phase shifting. It's the, the driver that does it. We have this question. Can PID control be applicable for all kinds of motors uh, seen here? I uh, suppose you, you were going to say something. Um, if, it in, if, if it's in, in terms of, of uh, keeping the speed constant, yes. If it in terms of can we drive the engine? It depends. If it's a BLDC one, you have some, you need some drive logic that will get a kind of speed, a desired speed information. And you can put then a PID speed control besides that. Yes, I think a PID, PID is just an uh, enveloping control uh, system. So as long as you have the right signals and the right uh, parameters to control, then you can use PID control. Uh, questions are moving up faster than I can move the mouse. For high voltage IGBT drives, it's better to use independent gate drivers for each IGBT. That's not really a question. Do you mean using Hall sensor to measure angle of axis? Yes. 
So uh, there are brushless motors around that have a hall sensor so that you know that your rotor has reached or the, the moving part has, has reached a certain point within the rota full rotation. Just to come back on the PID, like I said, you can always make a loop around the whole system. I don't have any more questions. Ah, there's a new one. Uh, yes, they are um, the BLDC, the permanent permanent parts is natural magnets. Here we go. So for our next uh, webinars, like I said, in the March 22nd, in about one month, there will be a webinar together with Microchip about FPGAs and introducing um, uh, introducing my, uh, FPGAs from a microchip, so that is not a deep tech webinar, but a more an informing, informative webinar. And then the next Electro webinar will be April the 14th about embedded programming and especially doing this with platform IO and I think visual uh, code, visual studio code, what is it called? Yes, uh, two tools that I really absolutely hate, so uh, I will not be joining that webinar. But Matthias will because he loves it. Yep, um, my my preferred uh, preferred editor of choice, so to say. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I think then uh, we can close this webinar, unless yeah, you but... still have something to say, uh, Max, uh, Matthias. No, just the usual goodbye. Thanks for joining us today. Indeed, uh, thank you for staying with us, uh, being with us uh, today, and uh, hope to see you next time for our next uh, webinar. Have a nice day.